Welcome to Friends at Work podcast, the podcast about friendship, work, and the interrelation of the two. This is Adetoye, and in this week's episode, I explore how to relate with transgender at work. I had a wonderful conversation with Misha Clive, an LGBTQ activist. I met up with them at their office in DuPont Circle. Prior to our conversation, I didn't know much about transgender issues, and so I asked a lot of questions, and she gave a lot of clarifying answers. Take a listen for yourself. I'm Misha, my pronoun is they, and I am the new digital director at Vote Solar, which is an organization that works to make solar energy mainstream. And Mm. that is my very DC professional practice introduction. (laughs) So when I actually think about how I want to talk about myself, I want to talk about how I'm queer and I'm creative and I'm a community organizer and, and, uh, and my family and where I'm from and, you know, all of these other things. But in DC, it's, you know, very, where do you work? Yeah. That's, that's the what expected do do? answer. Where do you work? What do you do? Exactly. How do you make an income in a capitalist society? That's DC is all about that. That's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but well, this, we're not going to be restricted by DC introductions. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned, uh, being queer, being, uh, you talked about your family and being a community organizer. I'd like to know a bit more about that. Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, sure. So uh, I have been um, a community organizer and an activist in the LGBTQ community mm-hmm. since I was a kid, uh, since I was in high school. Wow. Uh, yeah, I, I came out in high school and I was part of our high school's Gay Straight Alliance, um, the very first one that we had. And that was... Uh, high school organization for students um, who wanted to get together and uh, who either were in the queer umbrella or who were straight allies who wanted to support their fellow students. And uh, so I was part of that organization. I did uh, a number of different advocacy efforts as a high school student. Wow. And then uh, when I went into college, I was in our our college organization. It was called the Rainbow Alliance. Mm-hmm. And um, I did a lot more advocacy there. I, so I advocated on all all sorts of things from um, protecting trans people in employment to advancing marriage equality. Um, I worked on a campaign to defeat Rick Santorum in Pennsylvania when I lived there because Rick Santorum is a extremely, extremely anti-LGBTQ mm-hmm. uh, politician who had a lot of sway um, back in the day when I was fighting against him. So a lot of, a lot of different campaigns and um, a lot of different advocacy efforts over the course of my life um, and uh, a lot of local community organizing for social purposes in my community. Um, the past six years, I've particularly been focused on growing social networks for queer and trans people Mm -hmm. and bringing people together. Um, And there certainly are a lot of these networks, but um, in some places that I've been there, just there wasn't really anything for people to get together. And so I was part of building that. And uh, some of the biggest uh, organizing efforts that I've been involved in in the past several years in D.C., um, I was in a direct action group Um, that works specifically on the issue of the bill in Uganda, the uh, kill the gays bill, as Mm -hmm. it was termed, Mm -hmm. um, because it is uh, right-wing conservative Americans who actually came into Uganda, and they've done this in other countries in Africa, um, to try to twist the message and try to create these kinds of bills. And they've been very influential um, in African politics and advancing these dangerous bills and ideas that result in people's deaths. And um, I got awakened to this as an issue when I lived in San Diego. I was uh, a grassroots, working full-time grassroots um, to support the DNC. I was doing fundraising um, leading up to Obama's election. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had, um, we had, 
uh, one of our people in our fundraising team, he was from Uganda, and I learned a lot more about the political situation there from him. But then when I was in my direct action group in D.C., we had um, a Ugandan refugee join our group, and he had fled Uganda because he was going to get killed for his sexuality. And so our group kind of gathered around him and, and worked to protect him, and we just worked to to raise awareness about the um, American conservative rights involvement in African political messaging mm-hmm. around um, around the safety of queer people fundamentally. So um, the biggest thing that we did was um, there is a there was a house on C Street in D.C. That's very close to Capitol Hill where Mm -hmm. Congress is. And uh, some of the Congress people who were particularly influential um, in this this chain that um, connected to African politics um, and connected to the creation of this Kill the Gays bill, some of those folks lived in that house. So we went and we just stalked around outside their house with megaphones shouting things and we got media to come cover it and uh we got in the new york times we got on the rachel maddow show so we were able to get some national coverage and awareness for this and we had another um a whole whole number of other issues that we were fighting for um but um, at least for that part, I feel that we were able to contribute to more people recognizing that this is a problem um, because of uh, sort of the, the 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 distance and and the ways that political influence work. I think that that was about the most that our scrappy little direct action group could do mm-hmm. was just get more people to know that this was going on. So um, definitely proud of that work, and. Uh, After um, marriage equality was won in the Supreme Court over here, that made a big difference in just how I was able to spend my activism time um, because that's been one of the big issues in the queer community. So I devoted more of my time to working with uh, transgender uh, communities around discrimination and employment and spent the past year working in that field. So I've kind of always been in queer organizing. So right now, um, I met an amazing clean energy organization and I spent my past seven years at an awesome environmental organization. Um, both of which have an equity and justice orientation. So queer rights are, they kind of fit into the umbrella, but my professional career has been a lot around, um, advancing, uh, advancing, a better world through a, a protected environment and healthier, uh, safer communities for people. Okay. So, um, that's really, I mean, you, you've said a lot Mm -hmm. and I'm really, uh, on one hand impressed with the tenacity that you've had, you know, going from high school till now Mm -hmm. pushing, um, get educated and pushing uh this agenda it's i feel i was i don't like that word mm-hmm. yeah agenda is always a loaded word but yeah. there's a there's a joke but, in in the in the queer community um because the conservative right has always had this term of the gay agenda they don't use this as much anymore yeah. because a lot of aspects of about queer rights have have moved in a progressive direction on the national scale. So mm-hmm. the gay agenda, that kind of terminology, it still works for them in super conservative, super particularly evangelical religious circles. But um, it used to be a, a very mainstream thing for them to say they're pushing the gay agenda. Yeah. So our joke is always the gay agenda is wake up, make breakfast, get dressed, <laughs> go to work. And then maybe we might joke and put something on there like, completely destroy the heteronormative paradigm <laughs> go yeah. get coffee at starbucks <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah and okay so uh let me see how i'm going to tackle this Let, let's first of all go back to um your experiences at work it seems you've worked in organizations that support um you being a transgender but have you had um, uncomfortable experiences, you know, um, I can, so I'm thinking there's, you, you know, working in an office where everybody is 
traditional mm-hmm. heterosexual and a gay or transgender person but in this particular pers- situation your situation a transgender person comes in and you say the you, your pronouns they, the pronoun mm-hmm. they mm-hmm. how how have people reacted to that how do they um de- how have they dealt with it sure well so um first it's it's best if you know for someone someone who's transgender um you can say that they're a transgender person or a trans person um some people identify as a a trans man or a trans woman mm-hmm. um so if you say that someone is transgender you can say this person is transgender or this is a transgender person okay. but if we say a transgender and you just stop it there then it sounds it comes off as a little bit dehumanizing a little bit Without not putting quite the person right yeah at, so you want to put the put the person, person. Mm-hmm. yeah so um in my different workplace experiences uh so i um i realized that i was trans uh quite some time ago but it's fairly recent that i've been actually out about that in the workplace okay so just kind of on the the basic level uh being trans means that you don't identify with the gender that society says that you are and so there's kind of two underlying concepts around that there's biological sex, as it's called, um, which just refers to people's actual physiology. And there is gender. And gender is uh, an idea or a concept. And it also is a, it's a construction of many different aspects of um, how society expects people to behave and react and, and, and how people are expected to think or what they're supposed to like. And, um, so many of these things are based girls around are supposed to like pink boys. Are supposed right. To like exactly. Blue, and that's a good things. example because, um, about a century ago, it was the reverse. Um, pink was considered, it was an offshoot of red and it was considered an aggressive, strong color and blue was a more dainty, soft color. So, so here in America, blue was for girls and pink was for boys for a time. So, um, it's a lot around, you know, marketing campaigns and how, how capitalism kind of changes people's view on things. But, you know, then another example of how things have changed, um, in colonial America, um, the uh like the the white men who ran colonial america wore curly haired wigs right that was very common for the upper class or the or people and people in congress are always depicted this way you know um people of any stature to wear these curly haired wigs mm-hmm. and the uh, today today that would be considered uh not masculine by today's <laughs> society, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, less hair is considered more masculine, right? So there's a lot of um, you know changing uh, aspects to this. Um, you know what what's considered to be within a gender. So in our society um, and in most societies, there's a concept of gender as binary. So there's a man and a woman. Then there's also a number of indigenous societies that have kind of always had a concept of a third gender, um, which represents something different from man or woman. Um, So there are societies that have kind of had this concept historically. Um, Within our American society, um, over the past century, there's been a lot more deep thought on on gender and what it means and in particularly the last couple of decades a broad expansion of the kinds of terms that we have available so there's there's new ways that people can talk about their gender so uh in my case i came to realize that i don't identify with this idea of the gender binary of man or woman i don't construct myself and my identity 
in terms of those two boxes in the way that particularly the culture that I live in and that judges me, um, I don't relate to, to those constructions. And so there's an identity term come that that's come out of the queer community, queer and trans community in, in the really has become more popular in the past decade, um, called Mm non-binary. And so non saying I'm non-binary means that I am not a man. I'm not a woman. I'm not a gender that fits into that binary idea. And, uh, so people might say I'm, I'm non-binary. They might say I'm non-binary transgender person. Like I'm non-binary trans person. Uh, so that's, so that kind of relates to having a pronoun so, of they that's, okay. that's neutral and they does not have a, a gender connotation. Okay. So that, thank you for that. But I also want to say, how have people reacted to they? Yeah, well, so I just, you know, I, I talked about all of that because, because I don't, th- I think that, um, that for most people who are outside of uh, queer and trans circles, they don't have a concept of this idea of non-binary in the transgender world. They don't have an idea of this. So they is, can, can be baffling to people. Um, and so I think people have a lot of concepts um, because of certain celebrities and other things recently in American culture, particularly here um, in the past few years, there's been an explosion of people thinking that they are wrapping their heads around what it means to be trans. But But people still don't really understand these kinds of identities very well. So when I have told people my pronoun is they, um, the, the general response I've gotten, I think because, uh, well-meaning people who are outside of this understanding, you know, they want to understand, they want to be supportive and they want to be cool. Um, they've been very positive about it. They've said, Oh, sure. Great. Um, and then they frequently forget and, and they will use the pronoun she for me because to them, I look like a woman and therefore they're going to use female pronouns with me. And then I correct them. And then they usually say, I'm so sorry, you know, I'll remember next time. But um, generally people are very understanding and supportive and then they don't remember it at all. (laughs) So I'm definitely working on that. And I've only been out for a couple of years at work because it's just not something that... um, most people even know about meaning that just the nature of coming out means having to explain it Mm -hmm. potentially or choosing to not explain it and knowing that people are walking around with tons of questions. Okay. So do you feel like you have to do a lot of explanation because of this? Yeah. Well, I mean, I personally definitely do. I think in the larger trans community, um, there are people who are much more marginalized than me, um, by far um, who are constantly facing questions and are constantly facing particularly questions that like the validity of their, their existence even is being questioned. Um, and there's just huge amounts of discrimination against some of the people in the trans community, particularly who are in um, kind of the intersection of multiple identities. Yeah. So, you know, in particular, if you, if you're in a, if you're a person of color in this country, you face a lot of awful things that, uh, white people don't have to face and that I, as a white person have privilege about, and I don't deal with. And then if you're also a trans person, you face a ton of discrimination. So if you're a person of color and a trans person and you're visibly transgender, then you face a huge amount of discrimination. I am a white person and I pass. I have passing privilege, we call it, which is when you don't look to other people to be anything other than what we say is cisgender, which is if you're not transgender. So you would be cisgender. You're not trans. So I pass as cisgender and I'm white. And so that means that there's a lot of stuff that I don't have to deal with that's negative around trans people. I also don't tend to get recognized as as being part of the trans community um, by people who don't have much of an understanding of how all of this works. Mm -hmm. Um, And it can also be a little bit of a challenge within the trans community um, because they're um, because people who have uh, who have done a lot of things that I haven't done. um, For instance, people who have gone through medical transition 
sometimes there are some people within the medical transition community who don't quite understand people in the trans community who don't do medical transition. There's so many layers. Yeah. And like all of this stuff is in my mind when I'm just trying to say to someone, my pronoun is they, can you accept that? And can you use that? Yeah. So you see, how do you help a world that for eons, like generations Mm -hmm. has been structured to be around binary ideology? How do you help that world, especially the world that's been uh, a whole societal system mm-hmm. in many, many parts of the world? In fact, in most parts of the world, it's binary. Mm-hmm. The educational system is binary. Uh, the communities think in binary systems. Mm-hmm. How do you help us understand that? Because I'll give you an example. I was at the Starbucks the other mm-hmm. day, and this... I don't know how you take this, but this is this is what was going through my mind. A guy walks in, I, a person walks in, and it feels weird to say that mm-hmm. because I didn't know whether to call this person male or female because, remember, I'm raised with the understanding of binary. Right. This person is dressed in female attire, tight, um, tight, um, pants, Mm -hmm. wearing red high heels, spotting, um, wearing lipstick, he's got a full beard, his beard was Mm -hmm. fuller than mine, and wearing a wide-brimmed hat. Mm -hmm. And to me was an interesting, or they were an interesting curiosity, Mm -hmm. but, and I honestly wanted to get to meet them, but it was I did not know how to approach mm-hmm. because as I walked into this, this particular Starbucks, everybody was looking at, at them and it, they obviously weren't talking to anybody. Mm-hmm. And I feel like sometimes because people don't know how to approach or because someone in that situation may have faced a lot of judgment, there is a a boundary that's really hard to break to have a communication with the mm-hmm. person because you don't even know how to relate. Because if I call, will this person be offended if I refer to how I biologically see mm-hmm. them as male? Or would they be offended if I related to them as how they were dressed as female? Or did they not even identify as either of the two? Mm-hmm. And that becomes that was all of that was going on in my head and it was so exhausting I was like I'm not even going to try and that's Mm -hmm. for someone like me who's even willing to think about it Mm -hmm. and not think about it as just an absurdity Mm -hmm. as I know some people would or do so how do you uh, interact with how, how does one get to connect and say, look, however you choose to identify is how you choose to identify, but how do I, how do we relate Mm -hmm. and not have this, uh, and not have it at least weird on one side of the conversation, either on my side or on their side? Well, in so in this particular example, so this person came in a Starbucks, what, what did this person probably come in a Starbucks to do? To get coffee. Right. Yes. And so that that context is really important because um, trans people who are visibly outside the gender boundaries in ways that society tends to see and tends to notice um, are incredibly aware that that they're visible and are reminded of this all the time by different forms of discrimination and staring and all kinds of things that can happen. Um, and sometimes for positive reasons, sometimes, uh, people can actually find people to connect with, um, because of their visibility. But in the case of, you know, in this kind of example, I think this person came into Starbucks to get a coffee. And so, the way to interact with this person would be no different from anybody else in Starbucks there to get a coffee. Okay. And, um, so 
there are other times and other opportunities um, for people to get to connect with uh, people who are different from them, you know? So I think for a lot of people who are on some some matrix of difference in America that stands out from, and I, I repeatedly say in America because I've, I've lived in one other country, but I'm only, I'm speaking for my local experience, you know, but if someone stands out in a certain matrix of difference, um, they're trying to go about their lives, right? And there are probably lots of times when it's pointed out to them, you're different, you know, and they're constantly getting messages from society that you're different. And so, uh, one of the best but they things, are different. They're yeah. different from what's considered normative in society, but yes, but then it doesn't make them bad. I think sometimes we put the difference. We say different, and therefore not acceptable. Therefore bad. Mm-hmm. But right. but to not acknowledge that they're different will be, I think, be telling a lie. But well, a person can be different from what's normative. But we are actually. To be a progressive, inclusive society, we want to be about celebrating, embracing that, being glad for that, knowing that more diverse cultures create more amazing things overall. And so we want to create space where people can just express who they are and be who they are. Um, but you know, in a lot of spaces, we just want to let, let people live their lives, you know, let, let people do what they need to do. Let people get their Metro cards and their coffee and like get to their work. Um, cause kind of like what I said about the gay agenda, you know, our agenda is like, we want to get up, get breakfast and go downtown to work. So, um, that's probably this person's agenda was I want to go get coffee and go home. But, um, I mean, one of the, the big parallels in our culture right now, um, is with immigrants. Immigrants are under huge amount of attack, um, huge amount of discrimination. And if you could kind of imagine, you know, if if uh, an immigrant walks in a, a Starbucks and everyone else in that Starbucks is uh, an American citizen who was born in America, um, then you know, should everyone kind of stop and? try to have a conversation with that person or that person's probably just trying to get coffee right yeah but it's you know it's slightly different in that i I understand the Mm -hmm. the parallels you're trying to draw and i kind of see it but it's kind of different in the sense that they're immigrants or not there is still an underlining uh accepted acceptance of this person is male this person is female Mm -hmm. which seems to be universal and i'm i'm not arguing you know, in the sense that, oh, it's one is bad or not. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that, you know, in in that example, it's there's that similarity. But um, what I see you're trying to drive at with that with this knowledge is that, oh, should people um, stop and stare? Let me, let me give you an example. Um, and and. This, this. I hope this is, doesn't come across as insensitive. But if it, if it is, I know you're going to tell me. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, cut, cut it out. But if a clown walked into a room, and, it, and what makes a clown? Somebody who is painted up, looks different, dress, dresses different, walks into a room. Nobody cares whether they're immigrant or whoever or whoever is under there is trans or male or female. It's just attracts attention because of how they they present themselves. That's I I used clown because you know the outrageous colors, um, their uh, the clothing and all of that. You 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 notice Mm -hmm. now. If the stereotypical clown, and you know the American clown with the red nose, you know mm-hmm. the stereotypical clown decides that this is how I, someone decides that that's how they're going to be on a daily basis. This is how they choose to identify. No matter what, 
people will still look. After a while, it may take some while, they were like, oh, that's Toye. He's, that's how he's always dressed. That's who he is. That's his identity. It will take a while for the acceptance. Well, because he's outside, like you said, normative views. And this is just me looking at it from just plain, there's no judgment here. I'm just giving a plain view of this. But the, the, uh, the, the, the point, the, point the, the parallel that that is suggesting there is it's, a, it's an out- outrageousness. Like the, the idea of a, a clown is outrageous. I think from the perspective of those of us who are in the trans community, mm-hmm. what's outrageous is the decisions about a person's life that are made for them by the very nature of the body they're born into. We find those outrageous. We find those absurd. We find these things just jump out at us all the time and we're always conscious of it and it's always shocking. It's everything from you're told that because you look a certain way, you're supposed to play with these toys. You're supposed to have these kinds of friends. You're supposed to have these kinds of relationships. You're supposed to have these kinds of jobs. You're supposed to act this particular way. You're supposed to talk this way. And it goes it goes both ways in the binary concept of seeing things. It's a world that says that women are supposed to be deferent to men and be sensitive and emotional and caring. And it says that men are never supposed to cry. You know, there's, and there's so many different and things. And accepted for men to be domineering and all of right, that. Right, yeah. exactly. And for, for everybody, whether or not their gender identity um, is such a, a, a big aspect of their lives that they, that they realize it's different from what the world says. For everybody, there's something about who they are that is fundamentally not in accordance with all of these things that society says they should feel, they should be like because of their gender. And that, that to us, that's, that's the big outrageous thing. You know, it's um, that men have to wear suits, for example. If you're, if you are a professional man at a certain type of profession, you have to wear a suit. That sounds very uncomfortable to do that all the time. And you have to do that. Whereas women can wear this huge range of beautiful, colorful dresses. If you're a man and you would like to wear something nice and colorful and comfortable, like a dress, then the society says something is wrong with you, you know? And that's it's fundamentally not fair. It's fundamentally outrageous. And and I get that argument. In fact, I support that argument in in its core logic. Mm-hmm. It's just that what I keep seeing and which I I actually salute the transgender community mm-hmm. for going about doing it is trying to change something that's been institutionalized and imprinted into society for eons and that is a lot of work yeah it's it's definitely it's it's a lot of work and you know in my little field of it the non-binary trans people um because i would say that most trans people are people who are who fall under um an identity of being seen as the world originally by birth as female or woman and transitioning to be recognized as male or a man um, or the opposite. And most most trans people, I would say, fall into those categories. So they're actually falling into this binary system in a way and saying, um, I'm a man, I'm a woman, please understand and accept me that way um, for who I really am, regardless of what my body is telling you. And often people do medical things to change their bodies. Right. Mm -hmm. And they, they feel better with themselves and sometimes they'll fit into society better. And that makes life a little easier. Um, but then for my small pocket of people, we're people who say that none of this applies to us and we use gender neutral pronouns and we don't, uh, identify with these things and, and gender can be very fluid. Um, and we just want to be us. We just want to be, I just, I personally just want to be seen as a person, as a human being. It's every time someone says something to me like she or ma'am, it's like this reminder that people are putting me into this box. And it is something that is. But they're being respectful. They're not necessarily being mean, by the way. Right. Yeah. No, people are, people are following things that the culture tells them is respectful, like saying sir or ma'am is respectful, right? And they don't recognize that to me it's disrespectful, but I don't 
hear, I hear their intention as positive because I know what they were intending to do. Um, but if I had told them, please do not call me ma'am, and they did it again, that would be disrespectful. So it is, it is an uphill battle. It is a lot that we're trying to change about how people see things in the larger society, but this isn't, this isn't just, you know, just out of the trans community. This is a, a fight, um, that, you know, has been driven by women in patriarchal societies, um, all over the world fighting for equality, equal treatment, equal opportunity. And that movement is not just for women to be able to have all the same rights as men, but it's a movement for men to have all the same rights as women, because there's a lot that men don't get to have access to, you know, men, um, are not given the same access to, um, for instance, uh, time off to be with their children, you know, or, uh, certain professions are seen as female professions, women's professions. And so, um, we want to move towards equality where women and men can be whoever they want to be. And people can embrace the aspects of gender that they want to celebrate, that makes them feel good about their identities. And those of us who want to be outside those boxes can also be respected and seen as people. Mm. This has been a really, really enlightening conversation. And uh, I could go on and on, but I want us to at least delve a bit into friends at work sure. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> before we round the conversation up um can you share any experiences you've had uh good or bad in you know in t- your interaction with um someone at work like a, can you think of some particular experience of someone relating with you at work um particularly with your non-binary identity and how that has worked out or not worked out yeah, I'm, I actually had a totally amazing experience at um, my past workplace where um, a new person came onto our team and we became good friends. And um, I found out that this person was non-binary, like you. and <laughs> like me. And I mean, I worked at a workplace of maybe thirty-five people, uh-huh. and, uh, and you were the there, only non-binary. I was up the to only. I was the only, per- and I wasn't out. Nobody knew because okay. I was like, I don't want to deal with people treating me different. I don't want people to go from seeing me as Misha, their coworker, to. Misha, the transgender person, and now I have to think really hard about how I relate to them. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to deal with it because I'm out in the rest of my life with my friends and in my relationships. And and I was like, whatever at work. But then this person came along and I discovered that they were non-binary because they decided to transition and come out at work. And I was so inspired. I'd never seen anyone do this before who is non-binary. It's like often people who are trans, um, come out about it at work if they are going to go into medical transition that's going to make them physically look different. Mm -hmm. So they tell people under those circumstances. But there are plenty of trans people who don't tell people. They already did their medical transition. They're not going to do medical transition, whatever. They don't tell people for whatever reason. It's pretty rare that people come out as non-binary. There's not like a path. There's not a clear way to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, but it really just basically comes down to like respect my pronouns. Um, and my coworker did this and I was so inspired and we struck up a really close friendship And I feel like just being able to be open and out about these aspects of, um, our gender being so, so similar and how we viewed ourselves really helped our working relationship and Mm -hmm. just made it so much easier to, to get along on projects and support each other. Um, and at my new organization, I decided to be out about my gender from the beginning. So I could just have this comfortability everywhere and everybody's been great. So I find that's really, that's really great. But I've had, I've had experiences in the workplace that certainly, you know, have nothing to do whatsoever with, with gender or any of that. Um, and I think that it, it just comes down to how, um, how strong your, your trust and respect with each other is and, if your um, if your your working culture is oriented towards positivity and mutual support, mm-hmm. um, as opposed to um, 
you know, in some work and cultures, there's a lot of talking about people behind their backs or other things that kind of undermine people. Um, or there's management who just don't care about people and, and give people, um, you know, fire people abruptly and do other kinds of things like that. I've always been in really compassionate working cultures, So I mm. have really high expectations and I don't, I don't put up with anything less than a great positive place. That's great. So as a round of this conversation, I want to, so I'm thinking if I saw you down the street and I wanted to say, hi, Misha, or, or I'm talking to someone or like, uh, you know, normally binary, I'll say, Mm -hmm. could you call her? Mm Mm-hmm. Should I, how do I, how will it be, even though you're not necessarily listening or hearing, how will it be respectful to say, I'm talking about you, but it's non-binary. Yeah. How how do I, you know, easily I could say he, she, him, her in, in context Mm -hmm. very easily without thinking through that because learned English that way right. and this is how it's always been how do I you know it's one thing to say they and of course in in many in the thinking of English construction mm-hmm. sometimes they will look out of context mm-hmm. you know like so well, how, how do I use you hit they? on it though you found it because that it actually is really easy because you can use they them for a person a singular person now, grammatically, they and them exist for multiple people, but the reality of English usage is that it doesn't have anything to do with gender. People often use they or them to refer to someone when they don't know what their gender is, and that's a very common thing in English. So it's common for people to use, whereas there are other gender-neutral pronouns that some people in the trans community use, um, such as there's one that's Z and here, so it would say Z is going to the store to get here your groceries and that here. here it's a h-i-r so it's a not he not him not her not she it's here it's kind of in between all those things sound um and that's a little bit more difficult because this is new it's new language it's new habits but they them is very established mm. um and there are other you know i actually wanted to ask you um uh in nigeria if people are using pronouns you know if if, if pronouns are always the same or if they change, because in some cultures, pronouns, like when you say I or he or she, these things, the words, the little words you use can change depending on the situation. So I'm curious if they it, change. It Well, it depends on what language you're talking about. In my, just thinking about my local language, it's, mm-hmm. well. Um, it's, which, which languages are spoken in Nigeria? Tons, A lot, right? Like over... I, at the uh, over two hundred languages, mm-hmm. and when you include dialects, mm. over four hundred. Wow, that's a that's a lot. So yes, what are uh, what are the official languages? So the uh, the official language is English, mm-hmm. and each region speaks their local dialects, and then there's Pidgin English, mm-hmm. which is a variation of English, or an infusion of English, and some of the words in the local languages. So Pidgin English kind of like changes from. Mm-hmm region to region, but it's still the common threads through it. So uh, Nigeria might not be the best example mm-hmm. for this because it's not uh, uh, it's not ethnically uniform. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but speaking in Yoruba language, which mm-hmm. is the lang- which is the language and the people group that I'm from, um, I cannot readily say that we have different pronouns so we have different pronouns but mm-hmm. they are built on a different societal structure which which is depicts uh uh your status your mm-hmm. so it's more of respect right. so the way i would the pronoun i would use for somebody that i respected like my parents or uh, or chief in society or somebody it's mm-hmm. different from the the way it's a little like French, yeah. Which there's is an like, honorific so, level, yeah, exactly. Which is mm-hmm. like the French would say "vous" uh, oui. for, or or you would use the um, I forgot my French now, or use mm-hmm. another uh, verb, or you know, to 
to refer right. to uh, someone who you are contemporaries with or who is um, uh, subordinate. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a little structure like that in Yoruba, but it's not. But once it comes to gender, it's still um, him or her. It's still very. Um, it usually, it's the words that let you know mm-hmm. it's him or her. I can't think. Um, I don't even think we have a direct translation. And mm-hmm. any Yoruba person listening to this is probably going to whoop me. <laughs> if there's, if there's a direct the transla- <laughs> uh, translation. But yes, um, it's it's so. Some of this would would not translate directly if mm-hmm. if it were to be become an acceptable practice it will become mm-hmm. it will be very um either you have to relate with a person in english but in the local dialects and the, in how the cultures have formed it will be a different challenge entirely mm-hmm. to to structure through you know so yeah. the certain things will work in english it just would not translate directly mm-hmm. even even for people who are willing to translate it the culture is a little it's definitely structured differently mm-hmm. and the culture influences the language is structured differently from how it would be in english right yeah so in, er- in every culture people have to contend with those linguistic and cultural overlaps and and make their own system yes. and i think the easy thing to do in english is, and in this society that also fits culturally is they them and because i'm just so used to this actually when i see anybody I think of them as they, them in my head because they haven't told me yet what, how they identify. I don't make that, those fundamental assumptions. assumptions yeah. 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 And so, um, so you can just say, uh, can you call them over? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that's totally respectful and also works. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you so much for this yeah. really, really enlightening conversation. It's, I'm still wrapping my head around a bunch of stuff. And uh, and if I refer to you as she or her, please forgive me. You're totally forgiven. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been great. Yes. I've really enjoyed this conversation. And uh, I, I w- I hopefully we'll get you back on the show to have some more deeper conversation along these lines. This will be really interesting. Thank you so great. much for coming. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Friends at Work with Ade Toye. I'd like to thank our guest, Michelle Clive, again for their wonderful insights and for taking time out of their busy schedule to sit and talk with me. I hope you gleaned a lesson or two from this conversation, too. Did you learn anything from this episode? Please share your thoughts with me via email or social media. You can connect with me on Twitter at Friends at Work US and like the podcast Facebook page at Friends at Work Podcast. Also, tell your friends and colleagues about this podcast. The Twitter handle is Friends at Work US, and the Facebook page is Friends at Work Podcast. If you have a topic you want me to explore, or know someone interesting that I should talk to, or just want to say hello, please email me at myfriendtoye at gmail.com. That's my friend, T O Y E, at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. If you enjoyed listening, kindly give me a five-star rating on iTunes. It will help new listeners discover the show faster. All the music on this podcast was produced by Austin Foster. He worked some of his magic to make the production sound better. Thanks, Austin. Join us next time for another episode of Friends at Work with Ade Toye. Till then, keep smiling. Help a stranger. Lend a helping hand to a neighbor. In so doing... You make a tough world more bearable, even enjoyable for others and yourself. Bye for now.